Kreusar, hello, welcome to Rob Ryan Red. We've got a feeling Lewis Brunt won't be the only one improving his life by ditching the blue lot for the Reds or the Welsh this week. Uh, you know the rest by now. We're grateful to our sponsors, Red 10 People Development, and shout out to Hypnotic for letting us use the music we do in the show. On this episode, we'll get the lowdown on Wrexham's latest signing, take a look at a couple more who could be joining him at the Kairas, and bring you news of two matches that have been moved for TV. But with Paul Mullen set to miss pre-season, Wrexham really are at the brunt of it this week. Uh, Naif, how are you doing? Very tired? Very tired, very busy. Wimbledon um, this week for me. So apologies to any emails, tweets. And I'm just, Rich, you know what I'm like. You can vouch for this. I'm very, how can we put this nicely? Full on. Uh, on the ball, I would say. So for me to be so off the grid and so snowed under with work, uh, a very, very fun Wimbledon, um, feels slightly alien. So you're going to be able to catch me up and and get me through this podcast. And also before we start, shout out to uh, the gentleman who stopped me on the street in Balham to say that he listened to the podcast as I was en route to record this one. So um, I didn't catch his name because I was in such a fluster trying to get back. Um, but to that very lovely man and his friend, um, the podcast you listen to now uh, was only a pipe dream when you saw me about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, the mysterious man. Peter Andre didn't sing about you, sadly. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been a busy week. It's been very exciting on the Rex in front. We've got you know more news to t- stick our teeth into. We will, like we said, bring you some insight on the new signing and, and the other players who are linked with a move to the club. But first of all, the news that is the most relevant right now is that Paul Mullen has... As we saw rumours on social media this week, he wasn't spotted in any of the preseason training ground footage. You know the Wrexham sort of social media sleuths were quick to, to point that out. And Wrexham confirmed actually uh, yesterday, Wednesday, that that Paul Mullen has uh, undergone surgery on a minor spinal issue um, to... to my, sorry, minor spinal surgery to correct a long-term lower back and hamstring issue. It's something that's plagued him for sort of the last three seasons, so... Throughout his time at Wrexham, he's been carrying this injury, playing through the pain barrier. You know, a, a lot of players play through sort of injuries. It's quite a common thing in, in football. This has been the decision to to keep Paul Mullen as fresh as possible for as long as possible is to, to undergo surgery. It means he will miss the bulk of pre-season. He's certainly going to miss the tour. He'll miss that game against Hanley Town. There is no time frame on Paul Mullen's return it means, Nath, that for the second season in a row, Wrexham will most likely go into the league campaign without Paul Mullen starting up front. Yes. Um, in short, not ideal, is it? Uh, I, look, what I would say is I found really, really intriguing. Not only we're going to get on to Lewis Brunt, but when you saw the level of detail, I think is it you know, Spire Hospital or something like that, where the clubs are doing these rigorous medical checks, MRIs, you know, check it. When Arthur came back huge you know hugely extensive medical and so this will have been this won't have been a surprise to Rex and this will have been something that they, that they would have been aware of for a long time and Paul Moyne would have wanted to have played through the pain barrier um in the running because you know he was so important after that penalty at Forest Green he was away and he was lights out um and you know was in the, in the mix for top scorer come the end but you know, this isn't the same, I would say, as as what went on with the punctured lung and the broken ribs. That was an awful collision against Nathan Bishop that was a freak accident, really. You know, no one saw it coming. There was no malicious intent, um, no sort of deliberate attempt to, to injure or harm anyone. Um, this one just seems like a long time coming for Mullin, and, and he won't be on that tour. He won't be there with us uh, in Vancouver. I'm pretty sure he's going to be well rested with Albie and his partner um, here. So, look, it's not ideal, but, I mean, I, you know, we've been talking about that eighth striker, Rich. If, you know, we've got a lot of options, I'd say we've got a lot of options. I would say this only emphasises the need to do one of two things. You either go out and sign that eighth striker, go out and sign, a, I'm talking to strikers very quickly, Billy Waters and Jake Bickerstaff's player profiles cut from the website no sign of them um they may get reinstated after this just to make us look silly but when i record this nowhere to be found on the website um so they're as we expect they're probably going to get the chop um so you know either you do one or two things either you back jack marriott and say look you are mullins replacement mullins is going to be out for two weeks or three weeks at the start of the season you are a former you know league one top end league one striker 
go and smash it. This is your chance. You've got to take your opportunity when you get it. The rare, the few and far between, you can really make a case for yourself. Or you go out and sign another striker, a a 1A, 1B, a, a striker that is undoubtedly a starter that can not only compete with Mullin as, as the top dog, but can play alongside him. And, you know, that is the option. Now, what do you do? We're seeing Birmingham go and get Alfie May for 775000 you know, there are teams splashing the cash out there. Um, Charlton have gone and got, is it Mark Godden um, from Coventry? Other teams are moving for strikers. Rotherham went and got Johnson Clark Harris. Now, Wrexham have got one of their own in, in Mullen, but he's not going to be there to start the season. So it's a head scratcher. I, I, and I think, I, I, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm both frazzled from Wimbledon, but also frazzled in the sense that I don't quite know which side they're going to fall. Are they going to go with Jack Marriott? Um, or they're going to get a new one. I'm leaning on they're going to go for a new one and, and try and get an upgrade rather than trusting Marriott. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that, Nath. I think that, you know, we, we've seen as well, and we'll get onto the new signing, but I think the whole the whole plan now for Wrexham is to to just improve the quality once again. And, you know, the, the dream for Wrexham, and it might sound ludicrous, but the dream is that Elliot Lee and Paul Mullin are almost not the best players in their position because you start buying in better quality eventually and that the, the key players now eventually become players who have to fight for a place. That's just how you keep healthy competition. That's how you, how you progress as a football club. That's how you, you rise up the leagues. I still think Paul Mullin will be the main man for, for Wrexham next season. You know, interestingly enough, the, the statement from Wrexham said that the surgery is undertook to ensure that Mullen is fit for the majority of the 24-25 season. Like we said, if he's not having a pre-season, we are kind of joining the dots here, but we expect that he'd need a few weeks to get up to speed, get introduced off the bench and stuff. You wouldn't expect him to have no pre-season and then be thrown in at, at Wick and thrown in maybe at, at Bolton. You maybe think that he, he'd build up some minutes for the, from, from the bench to begin with. I, I suppose from Rexon's point of view is if there's nothing imminent on the striker front, and we saw last summer, as we mentioned most weeks, that Evans and the Conqueror were both signed in the final days of the window. Wrexham could be sort of holding their cards close to their chest in terms of striker targets. They might believe that that someone could become available right at the end. Well, this is the chance now, isn't it, in pre-season, Nay, for, for Jack Marriott to really stake a case because he's always he's been in a similar situation to almost every other striker at the club in that no matter how good he is, he's not Paul Mullen. But if Paul Mullen's had surgery and is sidelined, then there is a real opening and an opportunity for, for someone to, to to stake their claim. So it's it's a huge incentive for, for Maria. And again, as cutthroat as football is, an opportunity, an injury might be a setback for Wrexham, but it's a, a door open for for someone else. And I think they'll give Maria the chance in preseason yeah. to Inj- show him what he's really made of. Yeah, injury equals opportunity, doesn't it? Um, you know, players don't feel sorry for themselves. And, and dare I say, and not in Wrexham's case, but there are cases where disgruntled players are not wishing on an injury for a teammate, but they're waiting for a chance. And so if an injury does strike a, a, a player in a rival position down, I don't think they're too disappointed. And um, what I would say is Billy Waters, who seemed to have the nickname Pudding uh, in the... Uh, in the Wrexham uh, pre-season videos, which was kind of apt. Um, he's He's been written off, hasn't he, by by almost every everyone in the fan base. Jake Bickerstaff, I think people have sort of written him out of the plans for, for League One. Sam Dolby, liked by Phil Parkinson, but not liked by lots of supporters. Um, Stephen Fletcher, people know what he is. He, he will be a cameo player. He, and he will divide opinion. I think some people really love him. Some people maybe think they, they wouldn't have given him a new deal. Most probably think he's good as a cameo. Maybe he plays one of the two games a week. Comes off the bench. Oli Palmer, again, you know, is he going to start the season as, as the first choice? I mean, this would strengthen his case to to be there unless Rex can go out and get another player. And, and so it's Jack Marriott that's really interesting, Rich. He's the one who... You know, the jury is out on. I, I, I'm not sure what to make of him. It was too small a sample size, really, with with the minutes he got at the end. Scored that goal and celebrated wildly. After was he teed up by McLean? I think you know that was a big goal to get him off the mark. We saw him at Crew when maybe he should have scored there. Should have scored at MK Dons. We were at both of those games. Looked like he was shy and a bit of confidence. He has to hit the ground running because I feel I fear if he doesn't and Mullen returns. You know what confidence will people have in him to to really make an impact in a league where the standard will be so so high? 
Exactly. It's going to be fascinating to see. And again, really interesting to see which players Wrexham might target up front if they are to make a move for, for someone else. Like we said, there will be a bit of chat of that later to come in the podcast. <laughs> Moving on though, Naif, what a lot of people will have tuned in for is news of Lewis Brunt's arrival. You know, obviously we've had a Conquo already when Wrexham teased another one of those HP printer live videos. You know, we were all swirling on social media. Who might it be? Uh, Lewis Brunt from Leicester City, not a name who was on many people's radars, a player who was excellent on loan at Mansfield last season. Nigel Clough, the Mansfield manager, admitted last month that Brunt was his number one target for the summer. They had their own bid rejected for the Leicester City man. And 23 years old, a ball-playing defender, he referred to himself as in those club media videos. What an exciting addition, Nathan. You know, we've maybe been a tiny bit critical in the past that Wrexham have, have targeted an older profile of player, people who can bring immediate success, but not necessarily a part of the project in two, three, four years' time. But Lewis Brunt, looks like that perfect crossover of a player who can come in, do a job now, but can develop with us and hopefully move up the leagues as we progress as a team as well. Yeah, I mean, by Wrexham standards, given the over-30 club with the dad's army we were building, this feels a bit like a crash at the back now. You've got a younger Conquo, uh, Max is in there, Lewis Brunt is in there. I'm I'm really fascinated by the signing. I, I was speaking to a Leicester fan who, granted, he didn't pretend. I, I hate when people pretend to know every single player that's ever walked the planet Earth. You haven't watched all these players. That's fine. I, I know a lot of people will have seen Lewis Brunt from Mansfield, but you know you don't know what he was like in in high school and uni. And people that just uh, pontificate Sorry. on Twitter, people that pontificate. On, you're you're so angry as well as me that they're knocking <laughs> oh, your microphone protest. over, Rich. Um, but, you know, people who pontificate on Twitter, all various people. Anyway, I don't, let's not go down that rabbit hole. But anyway, Leicester fan I was with at Wimbledon said, you know, was highly rated in their academy, did very well at, at Mansfield. And it just makes me laugh that people were saying, oh, Wrexham has spent a million quid on Lewis Brunt. One thing football clubs love to do is to brag when they break their transfer record, when they break their club transfer record. That's, typically, you know this, Rich, Clubs love to tell you that they've made history, done something that they've never done before. Wrexham did not do that. Wrexham's club record fee is Ollie Palmer, 300000 So I don't know what to tell people, critics that say Wrexham are... We had lots of comments on our TikTok post, Rich, that said, oh, look at Wrexham Classic buying the league in a week where Birmingham spent £775,000 on Alfie May and are about to splash another four hundred fifty k on uh, Mark Leonard. And Stockport got a defender from Man City that is up, worth up to a million quid. I don't know, you know more on that one than me. Yeah, that was just one that I got sent for at work uh, that we ran. But I, I don't know the actual structure of that deal. But yeah, Stockport agreed the deal for him who, yeah, like you said, rises to, to a mill. So Rex and buying the league is, you know, that's just the narrative everyone wants to push, isn't it? But the fact is that there's a lot of teams spending a lot more money than Rex and, uh, this summer. And, you know, I don't be throwing figures out too, too much, but... What I've heard about Birmingham City's budget is that, you know, it's it's effectively sort of a top-end championship budget, isn't it? I think we've both heard that. Mm. It's, you know, looking at being... Should, should we, I mean, ballpark figure somewhere sort of like £20 million mark is, is one I've seen reported, which, you know, Wrexham will not be competing with that, let me tell you straight. Um, so, you know, they're, they're the type of figures Wrexham could have to contend with. And again, it's a reminder that Wrexham are getting into a league now where... Yes, we might have a lot of profile. We might have a, a lot of money that we can invest, but we are by no means in a position where we can go out and spend these huge chunks of players on, on players at this moment in time. We want to be sustainable. We want to build something proper as well as we can do. And I think we have done that so far. But on terms of Lewis Brunt, Naif, like you said, I'm not going to pretend I know everything about him, but we did <laughs> catch up with a Mansfield fan who saw a lot more of him than we did last season. This is Sam from Mansfield Musings podcast. He sent over a voice note very kindly. He could have told us to F off for stealing one of their favourite players, but here is everything he had to say about uh, Lewis. I think in Lewis Brunt, Wrexham have signed a player with a lot of potential. Um, he's quick. He's got a very good leap on him. 
and he's a very technical uh, player on the ball, likes to dribble out of defence with the ball, has a good range of passing, even played played mostly as a left centre-back uh, for ourselves last season, a back four. Um, he's not left-footed, he's right-footed, but he was comfortable enough on that side. Um, he also played in defensive midfield at times um, for a, about four or five games in a row, didn't look out of place there. Um he is still young, he's still learning. He made a lot of errors, which led to goals last season uh, when overplaying in his own box or trying to bring the ball out of defence when uh, he needed to put his foot through it. But he seemed to improve on that on the whole on the uh, as the season went along. Um, it was no doubt he was our top target for centre-back. Um, and I think Clough would have hoped that he could get him, obviously, what with having him this season, him knowing all the squad. Um, but I understand that Wrexham um, not only outbid us but also offered um, a lot more wages for I think 50% more than we could offer him um, so it's probably a no-brainer on his part um, as to a who would join um, in terms of how it's been received among Mansfield fans obviously I think we would have liked to keep him because I think he'll go on to play at, at least championship level and I think he'll probably make Wrexham a bit of money. Um, it's it's kind of a weird one though where obviously he does have a lot of potential but he's not the finished article yet so whilst uh, we would have liked to keep him he is obviously someone who will be replaceable um, and perhaps with someone who in the short term is actually better. Um, that would be the hope anyway as far as Mansfield fans are concerned. So Nathan Lewis Brunt there, he said, you know, he's a very versatile player. Oddly, similar to Max Cleworth, that he's someone who's played on the left side of defence, but is right-footed. And, you know, he didn't shy away from the fact that last season there were a lot of mistakes from him as well. He's very much a raw player who has the ability to to get better, but he's an investment for the future. Where do you see him fitting in? Do you think he's coming to Wrexham to, to start straight away? Or, or how do you think it will impact his going forward? It's a curious one. I'm just trying to dig out the tweet that I, I put on yesterday saying that, you know, what would be your first choice back five going into the season? And we'll get, you know, yours and we'll get mine and, and some of the, the listeners. Um, I, I think he's probably battling Tom O'Connor on that left side. I do like the idea, Rich, in principle. Again, we need to see how he gets on. Hopefully we see him in that game against Hanley Town. Tickets are nearly sold out for that, by the way. And then on the tour, we can get a better sense of how does Parkey envision it. But you know, Owen O'Connell is very, very good on the ball, but he isn't the quickest centre-back in the world. And I do wonder whether a, a back three of Owen O'Connell with Lewis Brunt one side, Max Clewett the other, is, is is hugely beneficial. And I also do wonder, Rich, whether if we're in games where we're up against it, whether that three-man midfield in front becomes a double pivot and a one, whether it becomes a George Evans and Tom O'Connor and... Uh, an Elliot Lee. Maybe it isn't an Andy Cannon that game. Maybe it is a, uh, especially away from home, you know, maybe it is an O'Connor and Evans, two great ball players. You've got, um, you know, both of them can receive under pressure from, from O'Connell, but that pace in behind, you would have Brunt and you would have uh, Cleworth and then obviously the wing backs as well. So I don't know. It's really curious for me. He probably, I mean, we, we put that squad depth chart up, didn't we recently? And um, on one of these podcasts and, it was very, very light defensively, and we said probably need two centre backs. You've got Tom O'Connor and Will Boyle sort of competing on the left side. Owen O'Connell is essentially standalone in the middle. Um, you could obviously drop drop George Evans back, and congratulations to George Evans on his two new two your new two year deal. By the way, it's so late we're recording this that I can't even get my words out. And uh, and Max is on the right. So one question, Rich, for you: I'm is it Max or Lewis? Uh, on that right side, or is it both? I, I still think we've got to sign another top defender this this summer. To be honest, mate, I still think there's, given that we've lost Turner Cliff and Hayden, I think that and Tozer, of course, I think there is there is going to be another addition who might blow everyone else out of the water again. I think that's that's just what I've got this feeling for, and it's 
it is kind of the track record we've seen so far. I think for me, and it is really harsh to say because I think he is always technically our best defender, but I've just got this feeling that Max might lose his place again, like he seems to every season. And then by the end of the season, you know, Max Cloeth will be a starter. I just I just wonder if, it, if he'll have that momentum going into the new campaign. And and yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting there, like you said, in terms of Tom O'Connor's progression, because we've said all of last season that he seems to now be a centre-back more than a midfielder. But if you've got someone else who's capable of playing there, does that free him up to to go and then become a, a midfielder again when, when required? So right now at this moment in time, I would have probably I probably would have O'Connell flat by Clowerth and by by Lewis, but uh, it's it's tough to say, isn't it? Because I've just not seen enough of Brunt, and I'm not sure exactly where he is going to fit in. Exact, you know, if it's going to be on the right or the left. Because there's there's reasons why he played there last season. It's not necessarily his favourite position or where he wants to play long term. So it's really fascinating one. But I'm very excited by the the profile of player that he is, and even that rawness. To be honest, because like we said, we want these players who can go on the journey with us, and he he, he seems to tick every single box. And the thought of him and Max playing alongside each other is very exciting for for Rex and fans now. And I still, like I said, I still think we are going to go out there and, and sign someone who's going to be a, a seismic def- addition in defence. So I can't quite nail down my yeah. back five just yet. But but you did ask fans, didn't you, on socials for, for their back five at this moment in time? Yeah, well, I, I was going to say, um, as I was looking at the picture of Lewis Brunt that we put up on Instagram, thanks for the people that are following on there. Don't you think he just looks like he's destined to be in a boy band? He looks too. He looks too. You know what I mean. He looks, You've got Will Boyle. He does look judges' one houses, doesn't he? Yeah, he he looks like somebody that Louis Walsh should take a shine into. Do you know what I mean? Uh, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. But if you think, if you agree with me, let us know. RobRyanRed at gmail dot com. I think if we're starting a Wrexham boy band, you've got to have Lewis Brunt in there. Four members, you can pick them. Lewis Brunt. I don't think Will Boyle's going to make the cut. But back five, then let's <laughs> let's get back on track. Um, Rich has put not the not uh, not the one I'm recording with, but different Rich put. My back five would be Barnett, Max, O'Connell, O'Connor and McLean. The That back five deserve to start the season and it's up to any new players to dislodge them. Matty Briggs put, for me, it's Barnett, Max, O'Connell, Brunt on the left side and James McLean. O'Connor slots into a midfield with Evans. I see O'Connor as basically a new midfield signing. I really want Mendy to start the season, but McLean deserves it. I think Mendy's actually out until he's at the start of September. I don't think he's quite fit for um, the start of the campaign. Isaac has put, for me, it's Barnett, Max, O'Connell, TOC and McLean. Can't find space for Brunt at the moment. Um, the Lucy or Lucy Wrexham has put uh, Max, O'Connell and Brunt as my back three, with Mendy and Barnett as my wing backs. Uh, a couple more than Sam Higgins has put huge dilemma. It would be harsh on McConnell if he was to be dropped. He had a great season, as did Max. The only position I can see up for grabs right now is left centre-back. We all know how good Tom O'Connor is in that position, but it's the only one that wasn't consistent last year. Um, let's do two more then. Um, Reese of the Dubai Reds put it. For me, it's got to be Barney, Max, Owen O'Connell, um, Lewis Brunt, James McLean. Tom O'Connell will return to his default position partner in George Evans and can slot back into defence during the season if required. Um, and Lee Chamberlain put Barney and McLean as the wing backs, uh, Owen O'Connell in the middle with Max and Brunty attacking the ball. Um, very early days, Rich, but again, we're, we're, we're back to a point where you've got three centre backs. And I'll tell you what, I'll give you mine quickly because I saw someone else put that Luke Bolton would be there starting um, right back. And this might be controversial because I would start most games with. Um, Ryan Barnett, Rich, but I do think people are underestimating the value the, the value of Anthony Ford in a league where we might have to defend a lot more than we attack. So I think he's got a place to play, a role to play in a back five this season. Yeah, again, I think the, there's also that question mark, isn't it, about McLean? Is, is he now going to become more of a midfielder as well if we, we go to the league? Obviously, he has done it at League One level. He's obviously got the fitness le- fitness as well. But we said on a n- number of occasions last season that he was targeted at times on the left back. You know, him himself and Mendy often felt like a weakling and we seem, seem to concede a lot of goals when we were exploited at left wing back. So you do just wonder 
if we need someone even even at left wing back who's a bit more defensive minded, if there is a way to cover that for for the new campaign, because we're going to be playing against teams with better attackers and teams who are of a higher caliber than what we played last season. So I do think that you know obviously our team will go up and and, and be pretty competitive anyway. But if you want to be in those those higher higher positions, I still think that at, at both wing back areas you you might need something a little bit different, someone who is you know, just a bit more savvy, you knows the dark arts maybe a, a little bit more and, and who maybe doesn't offer as much going forward, which, you know, is a bit limiting as a wing back. But there are going to be games where we've just got to sit back, absorb pressure and, and even be happy to take a point at places because there weren't many sort of grounds you'd go to last season where you'd be happy just with a point. And there certainly weren't almost any grounds in, in, in non-league where we'd be happy to just take a point. But I think in League One, there's going to be a lot more of those draws that feel like wins and there's going to be a lot more of those sort of gritty performances that we haven't really seen uh, over the last few seasons. Uh, you also mentioned there, Nath, George Evans's new two-year deal. I mean, that's a huge boost to Wrexham, isn't it, to have someone like him signed up, no threat of losing him. And it, again, you, you do forget with that sort of revisionism in the play of the season vote that if George Evans hadn't got injured when he did, I think he would have been a shoe in for play of the season, do you? He's up that. I mean, given fans vote for it, Paul Mullins' popularity always means that he's going to be right, he's going to be right up there. And he's always going to be popular. I Paul still Mullen think will probably still win Player of Preseason, won't he? That's the <laughs> that's the the way it goes. I, I, I think I think Andy Cannon's still looking at his mantelpiece at home. If people yeah, does everyone have a mantelpiece? Everyone's got a shelf of some kind. Um, I think Andy Cannon's probably looking at that, wondering how on earth he didn't win a goal of the season or a Player of the Season. Um, and also, Rich, I wanted to ask you. I don't want to necessarily credit you with it or, or one of your friends because, you know, I want to discredit you wherever possible. But did he, who came up with Gorgeous George? Because Elliot Lee used that exact phrase uh, in the preseason video and I'm almost certain that came from social media. And I think Rex even you put an Instagram up, didn't they, calling him Gorgeous George. I think it was one of the Manchester Reds. I'm tempted to say that it was Matt in, in the Manchester Reds. I think it was. Um, there, I'm there not sure go, how, how I'd be able to... Not sure how I'd actually be able to 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 date that or 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 sort of copyright it, but I'm almost certain that it was one of the Manchester Manchester Reds who who did that. So yeah, if, just, if you're just listening at this right, point, Rich, I think yeah, I Rich, think it was him. I think it was him. At this point, at this point, just stand on it. Just claim it is. It's it's easier to just uh, just press on and and not worry about the facts and don't let them get in the way of the the story too much. But yeah, gorgeous George signed on for another two seasons. Huge move and. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a really curious one because who knows, you know, there's a lot of smoke around the Joe Morell talk. And, you know, does he come in? I actually think with midfield, obviously uh, an injury or two can completely derail the team. I totally understand that. Evans had a spell out when he got suspended and then through injury. I, I do look at midfield though. And I think we're pretty well stocked with a set of players that most people would be happy with. I don't think midfield's an area... You know, for example, James Jones coming back in, um, joint winner with James McLean for the for the yo-yo test, easily one of the fittest in the squad. We call him the Juracell Bunny, don't we, Rich? But, you know, he didn't play a role, really, for the second half of the season. George Evans in there, Andy Cannon's there, Elliot Lee's there. Jordan Davis has been working hard with a personal trainer. I've seen that, and, and we had Luke, Luke on. And look, I know people have got their uh, reservations about Jordan. They feel like he's had enough chances. If he's there, he's got every chance to really, really go for it. You know, this is um, an improved level. He might get more time on the ball. If he can get opportunities, this may suit him better. Um, we don't know. Uh, I, so look, Elliot, Jordan, Andy Cannon, James Jones, uh, Tom O'Connor, if we're saying in there, potentially James McLean, uh, George Evans. It's a lot of bodies. Um, as far as I'm aware, just to wrap up some of the old transfer news, Jamie Lindsay, I, I believe, is heading to the, the Scottish Premier League. And last I heard, Burton Albion, who are splashing the cash under new ownership and with Fleur Robinson at the wheel, uh, they are trying to make a late play for Stephen Humphreys. So that's why that one's gone a little bit quiet. Um, but yeah, Joe Morell is the one that people think maybe. Joel, who's written a piece for our website about Joe Morell, sort of explained why he thought that'd be a good deal. But I don't know, Rich, I... I sort of feel like if I was allowed a couple more moves, midfield wouldn't be top of my agenda. I think a centre-back, a left wing-back and a striker, and I'd be quite happy now. Yeah, It's tough, isn't it? Because I, I still think we are missing maybe just another one of those 
midfielder who's just a little bit different, someone who's got that maybe that attacking. Like I said, Andy Cannon was really good last season, but uh, you know, obviously with with the new addition in defence, we've got you know the ability now to play with Connor in midfield. So you've got the cover of him and Evans. Cannon can play deep if required. The box to box hole, you know, losing someone like Luke Young, someone who's a set piece specialist, someone who just maybe offers you that little bit of directness. And you know, a lot of it does come down, as you said, there to the the unknown quantity of Jordan Davis because he was so good for us in National League. League two, things just didn't work out injury wise. He scored some good goals. You know, he did still make an impact in games, had that that attacking edge we know he's got. But it's just whether a player like him can actually do it at League One standard. We've not seen the evidence yet, and I do think that there is. Ne- We're getting now to the stage where we all we, know, we always have said, look, we've got a League One caliber squad. We've got players who who were too good for League Two. I just think in general now there is going to be quite a, maybe a handful, a host of players who there are question marks about whether they can actually do it at League One level, and that's exciting. It's going to be interesting to see whether or not they can. You know, carry their powers over to a high division, but you know there there are just some big questions about about midfield. I still think in that regard, having lost Luke Young, who I'm Rich, not saying yeah. would have been good enough for his uh, League One. Do you not think? I still it's... think we need to to replace replace him and get someone in who's who's got that tenacity, but who's also got that that eye for goal, that ability to make something happen out of nowhere. Rich, do you not think there's an element of this preseason being make or break? For quite a few players, because you know it, it feels make or break. Because for Jordan, he needs but do you to not have think a good the preseason. Have already been made almost. Like, not not that like, preseason is not make or break in a sense because they're probably going to be given a chance next season regardless. You know, we've both seen in the past covering sort of clubs at all levels that preseason form so so rarely counts for anything when the season comes because you know it's it just isn't conducive to proper competitive yeah. environment. Yes, but I, I don't know. I, when, look, when I look at it, I think you know. Imagine that you have a really, really good preseason, though, Rich. And I'm not just talking. You score three goals against a rotated Bournemouth team in in Santa Barbara. I'm talking just about application, the way you look, the fitness. You know, do you look fitter? In preseason, I, I think that goes beyond form. You know what I mean? I think you and I have seen. Premier League teams where, oh, that player scored twice, that player scored a goal there. Maybe he's going to rip it up this year and then he never does, belly plays. I think for me, what I'm looking for is, for example, when we go to Hanley in that first preseason game, who who's at it in that first 45 minutes? In their 45 minutes, who looks like they've really given it a go over the summer? Applicant, they don't I mean, just Bond and Bob gave it a go in preseason. Nah, I, I think you, you can tell. I think if you've watched, look, you're Rich, you're doing yourself down. You've watched enough matches now that. You you know when someone's made a big step forward, I think, and and I think you can tell I when just, players I, have, have I taken a step backwards. I think I'm so jaded by preseason. I just do not read anything into it anymore. I really don't, and I know that's maybe not the the, the sell you want for these tickets in in North America. But for me, it's just I'm, so I'm are we going, quite are we going to va- with actual matches? I'm are going, we going to, yeah, Vancouver, going to Vancouver just for a jolly going... with Jeff then, who's looking after us out there? Yes. By the way, shout out Absolutely. to Jeff. Absolutely. We're just going for the jolly. Not bothered about the game. Not at all. I think the game could. I genuinely, I think the game might be one that might be the worst part of the Vancouver trip. <laughs> That's he doesn't mean that. Listeners, we're going to have a great time uh, meeting you all, and if we meet you at the game, um, tell Rich to cheer up because he, it's going to be yeah, a lot of fun. Just be realistic. Just be realistic. Yeah, I, I, Preseason I think, football bores me. I, I, I do. I do just think though that you know, with Mullins sidelined, this. I'm looking at that squad, and I, if I went through all of them, I could put question marks next to a lot of them. You're saying you don't know if Jordan Davis can cut it at League One level, or you're not sure if, I don't know, Max can cut it at League One level, whoever, whoever you want to pick. I mean, we don't know if any of these players really can, can cut it at League One level for Wrexham. You know, Elliot Lee's been in there before Andy Cannon's played at the Championship, but those were a few seasons ago now. The different, the, you know, different players under a different manager in a different system. We we don't really know for for sure if any of these are going to be surefire hits, do we? So, you know, no. I think it's a it's a huge yes. Last season, we you know we were saying we didn't want to take it for granted, but both of us had Wrexham in there in the automatic promotion spots. So both of us really thought we were going to do pretty well. I mean, both of us thought we were going to go up. So I wasn't necessarily as concerned last season with preseason. And when I went and watched us get beaten five 0 by Chelsea, I wasn't 
in any way hitting the panic button. It was it was a jolly uh, for the, for the most part. This season feels a bit different because we, we went through the fixtures last week. We're going into the start of the season with with Wickham, with a Bolt, with uh, a Reading, with a Peterborough, with a Birmingham and, and a Shrewsbury. Every game seems absolutely huge, and we're not going to be able to go in cold like we did against MK Dons. So. Maybe this preseason is going to bore Rich to tears and maybe it'll excite him. I don't know. But all I know is it needs to be different from the last one. Last one was chaotic and nobody ended up getting 90 minutes. If we see a repeat this t- this this time around, I think that's negligence, in my opinion. So we already know that we're going to have uh, Mr. Lewis Brunt on pre-season. What about other potential additions? And Nate, you've been uh, getting the lowdown on on two potential names who could be moving to the, the race course, but of course things can change quite quickly as well. Yeah, there's growing noise, isn't there, uh, in the sort of the South London press pack of which I was based on there for a long time, and uh, you know some very fine reporters on that. Charlton Millwall beat and I don't know uh, Wrexham seemed to love Millwall and I don't know whether it was the George Evans deal that got him convinced but Wrexham have been linked to Wes Harding who's at Millwall and Tom Bradshaw who people will know uh, via Wales um, I think people did suspect that that move the other day which was Lewis Brunt who caught everyone by surprise I think people were expecting that to be Tom Bradshaw because he was spotted at the ice cream farm um, not too far away from the northwest. so um I just decided, you know, let's get let's get the thoughts on what would Tom Bradshaw and Wes Harding be like if they dropped the division, if they um, followed George Evans and and made the move from uh, South London to North Wales. And while neither move is done, there is concrete interest there from the club. And so I decided to get the views of Dan from that Millwall podcast. And here is a voice note he sent me about the two players. It sounds to me like Wrexham need to probably do a name change and become Rex Wall at this rate, the amount of former players they're signing from us. Um, firstly, we'll look at Tom Bradshaw, who's um, a very hard-working striker. Um, he's only really ever had one very prolific season for us, though. That was in the 2022-2023 campaign where he scored 17 goals. Um, we always kind of feared that would be a one-off season for him and that was kind of backed up last season where he only got about five or six league goals. Um, but there's one thing you can never question with Tom Bradshaw, it's his work rate and effort. He will always give you 110% every game. And maybe at League One level, he might be slightly more prolific. I would imagine he would be, um, especially if he has the chance to be paired up with a potent striker like Paul Mullen because for Mill, he's often played up front on his own, um, sometimes quite often with a number 10 just in behind him. Um, but often he's been up front on his own and had to feed off scraps quite frequently. So maybe playing up front in the two might suit his game a little bit more, um, especially with his willing running to get in behind. Um, but obviously he's, he's going to be in his 30s now and his pace will start to drop off a little bit, which is obviously a concern for someone whose game doesn't completely uh, revolve around that. That is uh, a key characteristic in his game. On Wes Harding, um, he was a bit of a strange one for us because he signed last summer struggled to really get a kick until October and he came into the team and he had a couple of fantastic games for us and we thought this there was this um, pacey centre-half that was decent at playing the ball that we've been crying out for for a very long time um, but that turned out to be a little bit of a full storm to be completely honest because as the season went on he became a little bit more of a liability and eventually lost his spot from the starting team in around February um, but he kept working hard and while he didn't really get much game time under Neil Harris once he came back in um, he was he was quite clear he was still a popular member of the squad and very hard working um, so I think that there's probably again a player in there at League One level um, and he has had a lot of championship football particularly with Rotherham so I think there is a chance for him to maybe get some more game time again in League One and he might do slightly better. He's also versatile, can play as a centre-half, a right-back or a right-wing back. That's his experience. So it might be a useful asset in League One. Um, in terms of prices, Mill aren't a club that's traditionally sold players for big prices. Um, so I don't know exactly what how big the fees will be. I believe both players only have a year left on their contract as well. So I think there might be the possibility of maybe doing some cheaper deals there with Millwall. I think they are two players that won't fe- won't be featuring too prominently in Neil Harris's plans if he can 
get some replacements in. Um, but that leads me on to my next point, which is I don't think that either of these transfers are going to be happening imminently just because we're very thin on numbers at the moment. We're yet to see an arrival this summer. We've seen a lot of the first team players leave. Um, we've still got others being linked away as well. And obviously we, we lost our goalkeeper, um, Matthias Sarkic, in very tragic circumstances. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to the squad and maybe funding for them positions in particular needs to be diverted away into other areas. So I think that the club are definitely going to prioritise in getting a striker and centre-half in. But how quickly that happens, I don't know. And obviously that might have a knock-on effect because I'm sure Wrexham will have other targets. And if these targets don't seem to be materialising from, I'm sure they will move on. So there you go, Rich. He, he wants us called, renamed Rex Wall, uh, basically, uh, because we're raiding Millwall. But he's got it spot on. Much like George Evans was late in the window, he said that Millwall aren't going to part with Bradshaw and Harding until they've got replacements in. While both are disposable assets, we're on a waiting game and, and it depends how much we want them for how long we're going to wait. Yeah, that that is the sort of elef- elephant in the room, isn't it, that that has become apparent in the last few years that Wrexham, although they are well run and like to get their business done early, I, I, do you know what I think this sort of stems back to as well, Naif? I'm not trying using this as shade on them at all, but it's like when we signed Sean Brisley, like he was a really exciting addition, but then Bentoza was available later in the window. And Bentoza comes in and he's the guy in defence. And last season as well, you know, when you get George Evans right at the end, and like I said, we got got a conquer as well after Foster's retirement U-turn. I just think it's sensible. It might not be the the most exciting way. And, you know, a lot of fans just love to celebrate chances and say like, oh, we've got our act together. We've acted quickly. And while there is clearly, you know, method to that, and there is certain amount of praise for getting your business done as early as possible in the window, you are then leaving yourself limited when these opportunities arise and you want to keep some budget available. You want to have the option to, to make a, sort of spontaneous move if if required. So I think Wrexham are being very sensible with with their transfers. Like I said, we, sh- we shall see if those two end up in North Wales and probably wants to keep an eye on towards the end of the window. Fixed news then Naif as well. We mentioned on last week's podcast that we will know all of the TV fixtures up until the end of January, January time, of January third round FA Cup tie, wasn't it? Um, by the start of the season, we have now learned the first batch of fixtures that will be on Sky Sports. And surprise, surprise, two Wrexham games are on there. Both of them away matches. The match against Bolton has been moved to the Sunday. It's still a 3 p.m. kickoff. I know that's annoyed a few supporters, you know, being a selfish Northwest based uh, supporter myself, I'm not too bothered, but I understand if people have already booked hotels, etc. That's a bit of a nuisance, but to be fair, there is there's plenty of notice still for for, for them to make alternative arrangements. And I must be one of the few Rex and fans who's looking forward to St Andrews on Monday night because my holiday, mate, I'm back the Monday morning. I'm going back. Birmingham is back yeah. on the cards. It was a write off last week and now I'm absolutely buzzing. Yeah, you were writing it off for the uh, 30th birthday surprise and you seemed okay with it. You'd, I, you were much more at peace with missing one of the best away days of the season. Uh, it's a, it's such a tricky one because, again, Monday will open doors for some fans who maybe wouldn't have been able to make it. They work on the weekends and obviously it's a complete nightmare for, for other people who maybe have that nine to five. But there's so much time. I, I, I do get the frustration, but also, and I hate the phrase, I've said this before on the podcast, I absolutely hate the phrase price of success and all that um, sort of drivel that comes with that. But it, but it is ultimately a fact. Sky are paying these clubs more. Um, clubs are getting more cut um, from the TV deal, but therefore they can put it into better players, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, supposedly going to improve the pyramid. I still think that it's a positive. You're going to go into the season knowing every TV selection through until um, January. You're not going to have uh, a, you know Sky turn around one day and say, right, in two weeks' time, this gate trip to Exeter is now on a Tuesday night at 8 uh, or on a Monday night at 7. It, it's not going to happen. So, yes, uh, I, I find it hard, though, because a lot of people were very upset when we put that out on Twitter, and yet you were gleeful in, in the whatsapp so I, I felt i didn't know how to react i thought i'm very happy for you because you can go um and then very obviously frustrated for the people that 
that can't go, but plenty of time. Tickets aren't even on sale yet. We won't all, even all be able to go, will we? So, um, look, that's got all the hallmarks of being a classic. It's going to be so much build-up. Brady, um, Brady and, and Reynolds and McElhenney, all the talk is going to be about that that conversation about the, the US game and whether it was going to be staged over there and will that happen one day. Alf, I can see the graphic now. Alfie May, Paul Mullen, if he's back, Paul Mullen, you know, uh, off the ropes and back in for the first time. First start for Wrexham of the season away at St. Andrews. You know, it has got the hallmarks of a classic. They are going to spend like mad. Um, and I think we'll be the favourites comfortably to win the league. So, cracker. But yes, between the opening game and the end of September, Wrexham only have two games moved for TV. So, so obviously, the opener, every game is on at 5.30. Um, that Sunday game, Rich mentioned at Bolton and the Birmingham game. So all told, Rich, you know, I was expecting. And again, I don't know whether this will happen anyway, but Shrewsbury, Saturday, 3 p.m.? Surely not. Police get involved? That'll Surely. Be a, that'll be a, a Sunday midday, you'd expect, wouldn't you, for for policing issues. You just try, make it as, as non-eventful as possible from that point of view. Obviously, as well, we saw, you know, it's... The police presence for anyone who went to the FA Cup game last season, that I think that's going to be dead and buried, essentially. They're going to try to kill that game off as much as they can with the fixture. And on the Birmingham game, I know I'm joking and being selfish. I still think it's a, a crap one for supporters, just because it's a Monday. Yes, it's only Birmingham, but loads of supporters will have to take the Monday off work. It means you can't have as much of a jolly because you've probably got work again the Tuesday morning. And the trains are going to be a nightmare just because the the, the fixture time, you know, I don't. I think we were looking at Manchester for trains back, and I think there's maybe only one we could get. That one was potentially even missing some of the sort of full time whistle to get back to to our route anyway. So yeah, it's it's a bit of a it's still a ball lake. It's still not ideal for supporters, but like you said, at least there is notice. And I think as well that it's long before the tickets are even on sale. So you've not agreed to go to the game yet. You might want to go to the game but you didn't know when it was going to kick off anyway. And it was always one of the matches that looked like it was going to be picked for TV. So this is just the price of success. This is what you you expect. At the moment, it's basically one game being moved for TV a month, which I think would mm. kind of be sustainable for the rest of the season. But of course, if we are near you know, the top end of the, the table coming in the, the running, then you could have three or four, you know, sort of in, in April or May moved for TV. So... Again, that will be the price of success. If if we're still good value for, for the neutral on TV, we will be moved for TV. So I guess we want to carry on having our fixtures moved because it means we are yes. still relevant. It means that people still want to be keeping Rich, an eye on how Rex and get along. Rich, what I was going to say, is I did get a message of a Birmingham fan who was absolutely raging at the, the decision to move it because he works in hospitality. And he said that week is also Freshers' Week. Um, so not only will all the kind of bars and pubs be rammed on that Monday night. I think it might, it might even be the start of Freshers Week. Um, anyone, I, I don't know if, if that does translate. Most weeks to the do US. start on a Monday from what I've gathered. Most, so, uh... I, I, this week, this week I, I'm, I don't even know where I am. I'm in somewhere in South London, hold up uh, trying to do this podcast. Can't even see rich because I'm, uh, my, my, my signal is so bad. So <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to love watching this video back where you'll be able to see if it actually connected and Rich isn't just laughing at me the whole time. Um but yeah, if it's fresh as week as well, Rich, imagine you do do an overnight stay, say, say you take a half day on the Monday you, and and you, you take the Tuesday off or whatever. That might be the selling point for some stay. supporters. You never know, mate. Uh, I I mean, I don't just does does, does partying with some 18-year-olds heading to uni appeal to you anymore? Uh, did it ever appeal to you? Not to me. Sounds quite accus- accusationary, that. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, just just curious. I, I, do you want to sort of relive your youth? Some people do like to relive their youth. You're, you know, I think we're going not down an eighteen-year-old anymore, here, not a nineteen-year-old. Um, anyway, we're going down a we're going down a freshers' week hole there. I don't. I, I dread to imagine what your freshers' week was like. If you were the year above me at university, so mine was um, fairly tame. Rich, I'll say that nothing, uh, nothing too crazy. So I think that probably is about time. I think that the way that podcast spiralled out of control at the end and <laughs> yeah, you can fill in all the in your windows yourself. Um, that probably is enough for one week of Rob Brian Red. Thank you very much for all your emails. We are going to genuinely, we do say this every week, but we'll actually read them out at some point. Just this week has been so ad hoc with our, with our schedules. Um, I was at a Widva today, got home at like 7pm. Like I said, Nave got home at 
what, half nine on a Wednesday night, and we need to have this out by like midnight or 1 p.m. or 1 a.m. or something. So, yeah, this is going to be a quite sort of rough, rough and ready podcast, but thank you very much to all of you who, who tune in every week. We really do appreciate it. Thank you as well to everyone who watches on YouTube. If you haven't already, please subscribe over on there and on the socials. Instagram's another one that we're looking to grow. And yeah, thank you very much for for listening. As always, thank you very much to Red Temple Development for sponsoring the podcast, making it happen, and to Hypnotic as well for letting us use the music. The stings in the show. Naif, enjoy Wimbledon. Is it going to be a, a bit more organised next week, do you think? Or do you think this is going to be a the new normal? No, it's not going to be the new normal. I cannot wait to get back to the home comforts of having my setup, having everything working, being able to look into your... Your glistening eyes, Rich. Um, but who knows? Wimbledon is very, very hectic. Um, anyone, also, if anyone has any questions about what covering Wimbledon is like, I'm sure no one will. But if they do, let me know. Uh, Robbrown.gmail.com. I'll try and answer as many as I can. But yes, hectic, Rich. Enjoy the rest of your week. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to sleep now because I'm trying to edit all these. So if you see this in the morning, um, pray for me at Wimbledon. Take care. We'll see you again next time. Some AFC podcast with Nathan Salt and Rich Faith.